Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and all of God's creatures. I'm Rev. Dr. Rachel Wren, and I teach biblical studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University. And I'm Rosie Canathal, PhD candidate in Hebrew Bible at Emory University. Rosie, are you <laughs> feeling fiery this week? Or perhaps spirited? Hmm, is that a Pentecost joke? It totally was, and they were really bad ones, weren't they? <laughs> well, that is a terrible way to begin, <laughs> but an accurate one. This is the episode for uh, the first Sunday after Pentecost, Sunday, June 5th, 2022. And I'm sad to say that Rachel does have the reins this week, so buckle up, folks. There might be some more bad puns. I just have to put the blame for all of this on Nikki Gutierrez, who is one of my students that came on the trip I just finished leading. He has infected me with bad puns. So that was for you, Nikki. We all blame you, Nikki. (laughs) Okay, Rachel, what have you got for us today? Well, as usual, I'm going to kind of do something different. Surprise, surprise, folks. <laughs> I know, I know. So today wraps up our Acts series, um, and we do finally get an assigned Old Testament text, which is Genesis 11. And Genesis 11 is, surprise, surprise, one of my favorites. But we've done some great work on Genesis 11 before. Um, episodes that you can hear at firstreadingpodcast.com if you'd like to focus on that text. So then I thought I'd focus for today on the assigned psalm, Psalm 104, verses 24 to 34 and 35b. Nice. So we're going to focus on the psalms, but this is not so surprising yet. I know. So the surprising part is this. Before I get to the preaching potential that I see in Psalm 104 for Pentecost Sunday, I just want to offer a quick couple of ideas if you are, in fact, preaching on the Acts text for today. Wait, wait. So you're willingly giving New Testament ideas when you could focus on the Old Testament? Uh-huh. Uh, are you feeling okay, Rachel? I know. I know. I think it's because I think it's because we just finished that series on Acts. So I've got to be honest, I have never liked the book of Acts. It's probably one of my least favorite books of the Bible. No way! I didn't know you even had a least favorite book of the Bible. I know, I know, but wait for it. I've started to enjoy it more, especially since we've been focusing on it lately. Good. I'm not the least surprised by that. (laughs) I know, I know. i got to stay consistent. But let's be real for a minute. So most church people know this story really well. But even if they know it really well, there's still a ton of confusing stuff in it. And if you're in a setting that doesn't know this story really well, then you really should focus on the Acts story itself. It is so rich with preaching potential for all kinds of people. And the story itself is so fanciful and dramatic that it's going to take some unpacking. So I want to just throw a couple of tips out and one major preaching point for you, dear preachers, if you're looking at the Acts text itself. And then, true to form, I'm going to bring in the psalm at the very end. Nice. All right, let's go. (laughs) All right. So first of all, what was the festival of Pentecost? Uh, Okay, so the following information I'm going to throw at you is taken or amended from an article on Pentecost on BibleOdyssey.org, which is a great website when you have those kind of lingering questions about the Bible. So you can head there if you'd like more information. So the term Pentecost comes from the Greek term meaning 50th because it's celebrated on the 50th day after the start of the Passover festival in early spring. In Hebrew, Pentecost is also known as Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks, which can be helpful if you're reading the book of John in particular. That phrase comes up a couple of times, so just know that it's also Pentecost. Shavuot is a biblically mandated festival marking the conclusion of the springtime grain harvest. And for this reason, it is also referred to as the Festival of the Harvest, Exodus 23, verse 16, and the Day of the First Fruits, Numbers 28, verse 26. So there's lots of names for this festival. Pentecost, i.e. Shavuot, i.e. Festival of Weeks, i.e. Festival of the Harvest, i.e. Day of the First Fruits. (laughs) Confused yet? (laughs) A little. (laughs) Okay, but let's focus in. Here's my favorite part about this festival. In the first century, Shavuot, or Pentecost, along with Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, were all primarily agricultural festivals. Not surprising, right? They would end or culminate in this pilgrimage to the Jerusalem temple. And here's the cool part. 
For Pentecost, loaves of bread would be made from the harvested wheat and offered at the temple. So I I just want you to picture this scene of Pentecost in the Acts story for a minute and ask yourself a question that maybe you've never asked before. What did Pentecost smell like? So we hear from the Acts text that it felt like the rush of a violent wind, that it looked like divided tongues as of fire. But knowing this history and this background, what did it smell like? It smelled like baking bread. Wow. Yeah. I love the smell of baking bread. Who doesn't? Oh my gosh, me too. It's one of my absolute favorites. And I I think that this, this idea, this smell is a gorgeous, underutilized image for what the work of the Spirit is like the smell, the aroma of baking bread. I mean, just think for a minute how that could be used, especially if you're in like a rural congregation or even a congregation that does anything with baking bread. The enticing scent of the spirit drawing you irresistibly into the sweet smelling mission of God. So I think if anybody is preaching on this Acts text, if you want to focus in on that smell That could be a really fun preaching point there. Ooh, I like that. Okay, what else? Okay, so then there's another preaching point where my Hebrew Bible geek meets my newfound appreciation for Acts. Oh, nice. Yeah, so when I was imagining what this scene felt like, I was was dwelling, you know, we did the smell piece, but then I was dwelling on the image of the rush of the violent wind. Violent is 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 maybe a little bit um, too strong of a word. The the Greek word can just mean mighty as well. So so violent always feels violent because that's the word. Um, but mighty is a good word as well. And I was struck by how this mighty wind is said to fill the space where they were. Now I've always attributed that that filling that fullness to the sound of the wind, but. This, the, the filling of the space caught me this time um, and kind of pulled me away from this idea of sound because it grabbed me and it drew me back to the Genesis creation story. Because there in Genesis 1 verse 2, a wind from God is said to hover over the face of the waters. And, and in past episodes, we've talked before about that, that hovering, which is the word merachefet, And that's the same word used for a mother eagle in Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, yirachef. It's a word that connotes a movement that fills the whole space over the nest, that that mother eagle is trying to fill up the whole space and take up any possible room that could be used to endanger her chicks. And in addition, in both Genesis and Deuteronomy, it's a move that's full of potential, of creativity. The spirit or the wind mirachefet in Genesis 1, and then that's followed by the birth of creation. And in Genesis 32, the mother eagle yirachef, and that's followed in the next verse by this swift upward movement as she grabs her chicks and just shoots straight up into the sky. So that potentiality is a really fun preaching point that I think um, you could have fun with as well. But there's also something cool that's actually happening in the Greek So the Greek word, the word that's used to describe the rush of the wind in Acts 2, it actually shares a root with the Septuagint version of the Genesis story in Genesis 1-2. So the wind from God in Genesis 1 is said to epiphereto over the waters. And in Acts, the wind feromenes. Can you hear that fero, fero in both words? It rushes into the house. So the Greek author of Acts is using the same root in this story as the Greek version of that potential laden moment in Genesis where the wind hovers like a mother eagle over the face of the waters. Wow, that is a beautiful connection. Oh, I know. And it it never, I mean, again, thanks to our Acts series, like I don't think I would have ever thought to look in Genesis to see if it's the same word, but but I think there's, there's something really fun that could be done there as well. Okay, my one pivot to Psalm 104, my beloved Psalms, to complete this picture is to to ask what the day of Pentecost might have felt like for God. We always focus on what it felt like for the disciples or what the calling of the Spirit feels like to us. But Psalm 104 verse 30 also says that God sends out the Spirit or the wind, that ruach, upon the earth, and then beings are created. So it's a nice thematic link there to the Acts text. 
But it's actually the next verse that seems to kind of fill out the picture of what that day of Pentecost might have felt like for God. And it says very simply, it just says, Yismach Adonai b'ma'asav. I'll say it one more time in Hebrew. It says, Yismach Adonai b'ma'asav. And that can tra- be translated either as, may the Lord delight in his creations, or quite simply, the Lord delights in his creations. So to kind of fill out this picture of that day of Pentecost, I picture God sitting somewhere, watching that rush of the hovering, protecting, potential-laden wind, rubbing the divine hands together, just kind of thinking, oh, this is going to be good. That sort of divine delight. So that's what I got there. Oh, I like that, Rachel. Thank you for leading us through some of the great imagery in all of these texts. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. It was fun. Well, folks, that will do it for us this week. If you like what you heard, check out more at firstreadingpodcast.com. If you've got a weekly text study or a buddy who you think would enjoy this podcast, do us a favor and send that link along. You can also leave us a rating on your favorite podcast platform. Big thanks to Tim McNinch for his producing prowess and to Trinity Lutheran Seminary for the grant that helps us to do this podcast. And thanks to all of you for listening. Until next time, I'm Rosie Candlepole. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching.